presentation on uh, uh, software-defined radio, uh, specifically the RTL SDR devices. Uh, my name is Daryl um, with the uh, the ham radio group here. Um, so stop by the table out there in the hallway and uh, visit with the ham radio operators. We're running a special event station. Um, and um, I'm also a member of the Amateur Radio Club in Roanoke, where I'm from. And I've also uh, given this uh, the same presentation to the Information Security Group there in Roanoke. So the audience for uh, these devices is kind of amateur radio and uh, cybersecurity information security groups. Um, but we'll go ahead and get started. So uh, what is uh, radio frequency? Um, radio frequency is all part of the great big huge grand electromagnetic spectrum. All the way there on the end is uh, broadcast radio, television, uh, amateur radio, um, and uh, all the everything that we, we know of as radio frequency. Um, you know, of course, going all the way up to gamma rays that just pass right through you. You don't even know they're there, but hopefully. hopefully. Right, right, exactly. <laughs> so, um, but um, what I'm going to cover in the first few slides here are just kind of some, some terminology so we're all kind of on the same page. What, uh, what are we actually, um, what are we actually capturing and looking at with these, uh, with these devices? So, um, one one thing uh, is to keep in mind is wavelength. So the the radio frequency is uh, the the energy is is being put out, and the frequency is the time between one peak to the next peak in a wavelength. So. Uh, Real low frequencies, the, the, the radio wave travels a long distance before it finishes one, uh, one wavelength. So like for example, what we're running um, down at the special event station is um, we'll have one radio on 20 meters. So the, ri the, the, the radio wave travels 20 meters in distance from one peak to the next peak. Uh, the kind of frequencies that um, just commercial radio is is much much shorter so it's in the the megahertz so it it just travels um, something like uh, two meters or less for one wavelength for, for like a two meter radio or um, a 70 centimeter radio it, the wavelength travels 70 centimeters so that gets into what, in the bottom part of their chart there, is like high frequencies, and very high frequencies, ultra high frequencies, even getting up to, I'm sure everyone's familiar with Wi-Fi, is in the gigahertz. So very, very short wavelength um, and high frequencies. Uh, just a little bit about antennas and um, the whole concept of antennas, especially if you're transmitting, is the, the, the antenna needs to be resonant. It needs to be a multiple, a quarter, a quarter wavelength or a multiple of a wavelength to be resonant. So you're going to get your optimum transmit, uh, optimum conversion of energy out the antenna um, if it's resonant and it's the length of the antenna is a multiple of a wavelength. Now, for receiving only, uh, that's not as important. But you do get you do get your best reception if you're using a, a resonant antenna. Um, and uh, the the way you uh, can measure that, and I brought one of these devices, and um, at the birds of the feather um session at 11 i'm going to bring everything down so people can kind of get hands on uh, looking at some of the devices is a, a a nano vna a vector network analyzer or a, a antenna analyzer so you can use a analyzer to measure the resonant frequency of an antenna 
to see what that optimum um, frequency is for that particular antenna. Um, another concept uh, to kind of keep in mind is these are uh, these are radio receivers, uh, except for the hack RF, which also can transmit. It can receive and transmit. Uh, so there's different uh, different types of radio receivers going all the way back to the beginning of uh, of, of radio. Um, the most common radio receiver is a super heterodyne, and uh, I think generally considered the most sensitive. Uh, if you're doing like uh, listening to uh, shortwave um, um, international radio stations and things like that. Um, and without going into the electronics, and like I said, I'm not an electrical engineer, so I, I can't really get too deep in the weeds on the different types of receivers. But uh, super heterodyne uh, receivers are doing some frequency mixing, taking the, the signal that it's receiving, mixing it to a intermediate frequency and then getting it to where it can convert it then to what you can hear with your ears so the whole thing with the receiver is taking that that radio frequency energy converting it into something that you can hear um, so and then this is kind of important and kind of going slightly off topic but like if you're a ham radio operator and you're looking at different um, handheld radios uh, is looking at what kind of receiver does that radio have is it a super heterodyne or is it the next category a direct conversion uh, direct conversion receivers came on uh, came along a little bit later it doesn't use uh, an intermediate frequency um, it's just converting a, a just doing a direct conversion and the direct conversion receivers needed a phase lock loop uh, to be able to lock in have a reference signal to lock in with. So the uh, the uh, invention of the PLL circuits with like a little crystal. Uh, so if you pass electrical current through a certain crystals, you get a uh, consistent uh, frequency. Um, and then what these uh, RTL SDR devices are and software defined radio in general is what's called direct sampling so it's like the next uh, next generation of receivers where they're using analog to digital uh, chips to directly um, capture and sample um, the signal that it's getting and the sampling rate the number of times per second that it's sampling uh, affects the quality what kind of signal you're getting. So the higher the sampling rate, um, the more data you're getting with uh, that direct sampling. And that um, that data rate is going to like a setting you're going to see in the software. So so on a SDR radio, all that is controlled by the software. So once once you've got your receiver um, and your your sampling, um, you've got to demodulate. So um, the just a pure carrier wave um, doesn't have any modulation on it, so it's not um, anything that you can interpret. But um, so you have to have some kind of modulation scheme to take the voice or music or whatever it is you're trying to send across um, so there's several different types of modulation schemes um, of course the most simplest one that everyone thinks of is AM and FM um, it takes the the signal the voice and changes the amplitude um, the strength of the the carrier wave you could carrier wave and then uh, you have the side bands um, frequency modulations a constant uh, carrier wave and they vary the frequency ever so slightly to modulate uh, you have phase modulation um, uh, phase PSK is phase shift keying so the the radio wave is got in in 360 degree space has phases and you can turn the the radio wave one phase for like zero turn it another way for one and then send zero and ones by just shifting 
um, the phase of the radio wave, and that's that's something that we're uh, we're doing PSK 31 down there in the um, the special event station, and then uh, some other digital uh, voice type um, modulation schemes, um, uh, frequency domain and time domain. Um, again, uh, changing frequency or altering the timing. Uh, I uh, believe I'm right. I think DMR radio is time domain. Um, uh, C4FM is another digital um, modulation scheme um, that uh, amateur radio uses. Um, but anyway, this is just another just terminology, things to keep in mind when you're getting into the software because then in the software you're picking what kind of modulation, demodulation that you're wanting to do with the signal that you're receiving. Uh, another another concept then I was talking about um, the the frequencies the uh, different frequency bands where uh, w what frequencies are can these devices pick up um, the VHF is like the 138 to 174 175 megahertz so millions millions of cycles per second um, ultra high frequency ranges. Um, and then uh, for, for communication, in, uh, industrial and uh, other communication uh, uses, you get up into 8 and 900 megahertz um, and then beyond getting up on up into the uh, gigahertz um, with Wi-Fi and other uh, medical devices. Um, speaking of which, so then the, the next thing I was wanted to uh, point out is ISM, the Industrial Scientific and Medical um, Bands. So beyond just TV and radio and uh, amateur radio communications, uh, police, fire, all communication um, uses for radio frequencies, uh, we also have industrial um, and scientific um, bands. Um, and 2.4 gigahertz, of course, and the 5 gigahertz, uh, different Wi-Fi frequencies. Um, these 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 frequency bands are used for not only communications but non-communications like uh, microwave ovens and other uh, heating devices, um, wireless networking, um, Bluetooth, uh, uh, RFID devices. So uh, there's uh, these these uh, RTL SDR devices are capable of uh, capturing signals up in these ranges too. Um, so um, a few definitions and some terms that uh, you'll you'll see when you're like looking at different devices and you're shopping around and you're trying to figure out which which device would you like to get. Um, and the funny story, so the, this RTL chip, this 8-bit analog digital converter, uh, was originally designed for to be a, a, a USB TV receiver. And who, uh, what, whoever it was that designed that, the company that they were designing it for, was just trying to come up with just a really cheap way of making a USB uh, television receiver, uh, especially like in, I think it's pretty popular in Europe, um, and you can just plug these into your lap, your laptop or your desktop computer, and use it as a TV receiver to watch TV. Well, just that uh, by happy accident, they discovered it's like, well, you know, these these are like really hackable, and you can use these chips for other things than uh, just television. Um, so these RTL, the RTL two eighty three two. 2832U, I think, is what most of these devices uh, have in them. Uh, they also have a TCXO temperature compensating oscillator to kind of help lock in the, the frequency. <coughs> and uh, the higher the PPM, uh, the, I think the more accurate the, the device is. 
And then in conjunction with the RTL chip, there's um, a radio tuner chip in the device. And um, there's a couple of, um, couple of different types of radio tuner chips that you can find in some of these devices. So um, the R820T and then the 820T2 is the newer one. So if you're shopping around, you, you want to look for something with maybe the newer tuner chip in it. Uh, I also found that there were some other devices out there with a completely different tuner chip, the E4000, has a slightly extended range on what it can uh, tune. But uh, by design, they have some weird gap there that it, uh, I'm not sure as far as the physics of why that particular tuner chip has that gap, but it does. So that's just something to keep in mind. So, so so now we'll get uh, down to actually you're, you're shopping around for one of these devices. What are, uh, compare some of the different devices. And I've, I've picked uh, three. Uh, there's actually several of them out there on the market now. But they, they pretty much have a lot in common. Of course, the, the one that everyone thinks of when you think of these SDR dongles is the RTL disc SDR. You go to their website, they have just, oodles and oodles of information. But this is the V3, and uh, we were talking a little bit earlier that some of the earlier versions were a little different. The V3, I think, is what's out there currently. It's got the uh, RTL 2832U and the 820T2 chips in it, uh, one PPM um, on the TCXO. And then their their frequency range that they're capable of tuning in on. Um, uh, this particular brand also has uh, HF direct mode. I've never actually experimented with myself uh, trying to put it in that mode um, with the software. Um, but you can actually get down into some amateur radio frequencies um, with these devices. Uh, the next one I brought along for comparison was the NESDR. Um, very, very similar device, uh, slightly different uh, price range, uh, slightly different frequency st stability. I would say it's not, the frequency st stability is not as good as the RTL SDR, um, but a very similar frequency range. Uh, I brought and like I said, at the Birds of the Feather session, I'll, I'll have these in the room and you can come by and look at them and, and uh, see what they look like. But the, someone actually gave me one of these. They had bought it, uh, played around with it. It's like, what in the world is this device? Does anybody want it? <laughs> and so I said, sure, I'll take it. <laughs> um, anyway, but that's another one. Uh, the form factor is the big, uh, the big difference. I'll, jump back to the other these these are when you're fitting these like especially like on a raspberry pi they take up all the space on the U usb ports they they're kind of clunky and get in the way whereas the ne sdr is much more compact and a little easier to fit more than one what price range are we talking about these things? uh the price range the uh rtl sdrs are like in the 20 dollar range the uh, what I've seen the NESDR um, are just slightly higher, maybe upper upper twenties, lower thirties dollar range. Uh, this one, so this is like the deluxe version of the NESDR, um, is like maybe in the thirty forty dollar price range. Uh, so it and, and you might notice then it's got a, it's got the other tuner chip. So it's got a uh, much higher frequency range that it's able to pull in uh, with the E4000 tuner chip. Um, but as what I read in the reviews, not quite getting up into 2.4 for um, Wi-Fi. So uh, one, one person that wrote a review on this device was kind of disappointed. They were hoping they could, they could capture and analyze Wi-Fi signals, but doesn't quite get there. But the uh, the fourth device that I brought along um, 
is a big jump in price range. So entry level, the RTL, SDR, play around with if you really want to get serious uh, about doing some experimenting is the uh, Hack RF1. Um, completely different um, device and much more expensive, so got to make a major commitment there. But it's actually a, a fully, um, it's, it's a full SDR device that can receive and transmit. Uh, over 300. Over uh, 300. All right, right. So that's, it's a big jump from a $25 device to, to one of these. But this is, this is like if you're doing some, uh, uh, radio frequency research or or information security um, but it's uh, it's got a full uh, arm cortex m4 microcontroller chip in there um, it's it's got the the uh, chip that's doing uh, some of the intermediate frequency mixing and a transceiver chip it transmits and receives uh, low band and high band pass filters for doing filtering of your signal that's all controlled uh, by the the software um, just a little bit more of the stats uh, it's a half duplex transceiver in other words it can it can only receive or transmit one at a time a full duplex transceiver could receive and transmit at the same time but this is just a half half duplex which is fine uh, most amateur radios are half half duplex transceivers but uh, everything is uh, configurable in the software uh, your transmit receive gain uh, all the the filtering uh, talking about sampling rate this is uh, direct sampling so up to 20 20 million samples per per second sampling rate so that's that's getting some real high definition sampling of the the signal all controlled in the software so those that's the those are the devices i brought along like i said everyone's welcome to come down to the birds of the feather session and uh, take a look at these um and i'm really flying along in time here um but we'll jump in next uh so i had to had to bring this back into linux a little bit here so um, uh, the software uh, for these for these devices um, the uh, and uh, see if I'm pronouncing it right I, I would pronounce it GNU radio but maybe you can correct me if I'm not pronouncing that right um, is the, the very um, th this software has a whole lot of depth you could you could spend weeks at a time learning this software very granular control of every step of the of the controlling the device um, and um, the uh, hack rf1 that company that puts that out has some really good uh, tutorials on their website on um, on this software uh, for controlling the the hack rf1 um, but if you want something with a little easier uh, user-friendly uh, GUI is the um, on Linux is the GQRX software uh, which uses GNU radio uh, is just kind of a, a more user-friendly front end for that um, and lots of um, contributors have written different plugins for this software so uh, out of the box, it's, it can uh, demodulate um, AM and FM, but you can also modules written for it for um, capturing and demodulating some of the other modulation schemes you might want to be looking at. Uh, software is available uh, for Linux and uh, Mac OS. Um, so bear with me. The next slide, don't throw tomatoes at me or anything. There's there's Windows software out there for these devices too. So um the 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 one that i've played around with a little bit uh is the sdr sharp 
the Air Spy um, device, um, the software for their device also supports these other devices, uh, just runs on the Windows platform. And then um, another one I found was the Cubic SDR software. I haven't uh, actually tried it yet. But if you go to the rtlsdr.com website, uh, they have the complete list of all the different um, software out there for the different uh, models of device and what's compatible with what. Um, probably doesn't show up very good on my slide here. Some Just some links, the airspy.com um, slash download um, for looking at their software. Uh, how many people are familiar with Adafruit Industries? Yeah, most everyone, yeah. They've got some really introductory level um, tutorials on um, RTL SDR. Um, so I, I recommend checking their website out and some of their, and that, o that other link is awfully hard to see, but um, if, um, if, you, if you Google um, RTL SDR, Linux software, you'll find that uh, haji.nl, uh, it's a nice little document with some, covers a lot of the basics. But um, I'll focus just on um, installing the, the GQRX on Linux. So the two machines that I have, one's uh, running Ubuntu, one's running Pop! OS. Um, I've got it installed on one and not the other. So at the birds of the feather, uh, I'm going to try to install the software on the Pop! OS machine and see how big of a fool I can make of myself trying to get it to work. I got it to work on the Ubuntu machine. So, um, But most of the, the, the Linux distribution software repositories have, uh, have this in the repository. It's uh, what I found is slightly older version um, of the GQRX. But yeah, from the command line, uh, you can just uh, install the uh, GNU radio and the GQRX packages. You need them both. I've, I've learned the hard way and installed just GQRX by itself and lo and behold, it didn't work. It's like I didn't install everything I need. So. Um, there's also the source codes available on GitHub if for those that want to just um, compile it for their own uh, distribution. Uh, there's also an app image um, compiled binary that um, that you can download from the GitHub. Um, how many people use app images for? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, it's a little bit different but I got it to work so um, the the thing I kept getting hung up on is once you once you you download it and you put it in a directory where you want it to be you've got to edit the properties and make it uh, executable but once you do that you can click on it and run it and that you get that version that's going to be the the newest stable ver version out there um, the other little gotcha that I found was uh, by default, when you plug one of these devices in, uh, the, the Linux thinks it's a TV receiver. It's got the drivers for the DVB uh, uh, that use the device as a television receiver. So you actually got to get the right driver for the RTL SDR, which then you have to install separately. And um, um, there's a good document on the NESDR um, new new no electric or new electric, however that company name. They've got a good tutorial. Um, at least on one of my laptops, uh, I had to uh, I had to blacklist the uh, the DVB driver so it wouldn't try to load that driver when you plugged it in, and it would actually use the RTL SDR driver instead. To, to finally get it to work so but we'll play around with that um, on the laptops and the other session 
So some different uh, use cases um, to kind of wrap it up. Um, I, um, I know I'm droning on here just a little bit, but uh, we'll talk about some possible use cases for these devices. Uh, of course, the uh, the hello world of the uh, of SDR is just uh, using the software to 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 capture and demodulate just commercial uh, radio broadcasts, and it does that right out of the box. Um, what's really interesting, though, is you get you get to see the on the on the 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 radio spectrum what and uh the newer uh the newer radio stations now broadcast information along with the audio and that's the uh that's that rds information you'll see the little spikes uh with that on either side of the main the main peak where the where the music's being played um so you can actually uh, use it uh with the to decode that RDS information with the right plug-in. Um, the other, the other big use is amateur radio or public service um, uh, listening in, in on AM, FM, DMR, or P25 um, uh, uh, signals. The P25 is uh, used uh, pretty commonly in like um, uh, fire rescue and police radio. Um, so there's uh, there's people that have written uh, plugins for the for the software to be able to demodulate uh, DMR and P25 digital signals. Um, another um, good use case I, I've seen is uh, listening on air traffic control um, and um, the. Uh, the ADSB positioning data that's being transmitted, and I've seen um, use cases where people are like mapping out uh, the planes coming in and out of their area. Uh, APRS, the um, the popular, a little bit more popular in ham radio community, the uh, mapping of your position uh, while you're traveling. Um, decoding those transmissions and uh, fun to listen to the International Space Station when it passes over. So beyond uh, communications, um, uh, doing some research and security, information security type um, use of these devices uh, like for one trying to track down say you've got some RF noise in a particular environment that's causing interference um, uh, you reverse engineering some unknown uh, modulation protocols that you're seeing on the the spectrum um, my my one and only good story about the uh, using um, the devices for uh, interference investigation. <coughs> I work in healthcare IT, and one hospital I was working at um, was having problems uh, in the in surgery. Um, the radiology has a device called a C arm, which is just a mobile X-ray machine that uh, they can roll up and goes around the patient on the surgical bed. Uh, the surgical table and can do an x-ray while the surgery is going on and those devices were all on uh, Wi-Fi and one particular surgical room the when they brought the C arm uh, in it would always get knocked off the Wi-Fi and it needs the Wi-Fi connection to send the image uh, so that the radiologists can see it and that was really baffling baffling them it went on for quite a while and and uh, so being an amateur radio operator in the IT department, it's like, well, we could go in there and see if we can figure out what's knocking that, you know, in that one room, what's knocking that uh, device off the Wi-Fi. So um, myself and another person in the ham radio club, we, he had, uh, he, he was an electrical engineer. He knew much more about it than I did and uh, brought in his oscilloscope. We suited up and, um, proceeded to get really strange looks while we rolled this oscilloscope up and down the hallway going in and out of the surgical suites 
and uh, we were looking for all kinds, you know, was it cell phones, was it people sitting in the waiting room right next to that particular uh, room where the problem was. Um, so we got to the, to the one spot where we narrowed down about what the, where the source of the interf interference was coming from. And the other person I was with there, he, he, he's looking at the, the peak there on the oscilloscope and he goes, I th I think I see modulation on that signal. Something something's being modulated on that signal. So he engages the circuit uh, the circuit to demodulate it. And what it was, um, one floor down is was the central supply in the uh, uh, sterilization unit uh, where they sterilized the instruments. And uh, for convenience, they decided to just go out and buy their own cordless phone because they didn't always want to have to stand at the desk with the wired phone. They wanted a cordless phone. Well, what did they do? They bought a cordless phone that's on 2.4 gigahertz. So every time they picked up that phone and started talking to the nurses on the surgery suite, it was knocking the device off the Wi-Fi. So the, we, once he demodulated, I, I heard him talking, and it's like, they were, it's like I, I know what they're talking about. They're talking about, they're asking for a new, a new tray to be sent up for a case. And it's like, that's central supply. So anyway, long story short, we had, we had to tell them, no, you can't have your 2.4 gigahertz wireless phone. You got to get a 900 megahertz cordless phone. So anyway. That's my only interesting story. So, but uh, some other good use cases of getting into uh, security. Um, there's um, some good videos there on YouTube about uh, uh, the people that kind of hacked the garage door openers, and the the early garage door openers weren't were not very sophisticated. They were just um, sending like an eight bit. Um, pulse signal um, and it very quickly figured out how they could brute force every possible 8-bit combination um, to open up the garage door uh, garage doors so so you could uh, drive by and just open up all your neighbors garage door openers if you had a device that could transmit Another good uh, use case I and um, I found, um, uh, and uh, I'm not even going to try to pronounce. I, I, I'll probably get it wrong, but if you go on YouTube and um, and and look up um, the R E C E S S I M, he's also got a website with all his research that he's done. Um, the the newer power meters now the you don't have to have meter readers come out because they're they're transmitting the usage at each home and um, what he discovered and what's very interesting is the each power meter in your neighborhood is like relaying uh, like a digipeter relaying the signal on and then they put uh, central uh, receivers in the neighborhood that collects all that data and then sends it back home to uh, to, to measure your usage and um, he has got several YouTube videos where he's like um, he's found these power meters on eBay of all places and taken them apart and reverse engineered them and and it's how how can you uh, like um, use these devices to capture that data and uh, kind of see what your power usage is yourself. Make sure that they're actually sending you a correct bill. Uh, the other interesting thing, what he found in that research is um, it's possible for them to collect all kinds of other usage data on the devices in your home uh, based on um, patterns uh, in the, in the uh, when like when the device like when your refrigerator starts up and it has a power surge and then you can identify specific uh, types of brands of refrigerators by the the pattern of that surge so apparently they're collecting that kind of data too or possible to collect that kind of data 
uh, on hackaday.com uh, website if you uh, searched um, uh, home power meters with RTL SDR another person um, published a good article about using these devices for um, capturing that data that the power meters are transmitting um, in that article he mentioned the hardest part is like sure you can you can capture this data but which data is yours because the the power meters are all relaying everyone else's like a dig like I said like a digipeter does and to the central receiver so it's figuring out um, there's actually uh, a signature um, um, a CRC signature or something like that that you kind of have to figure out to figure uh, to get which power meter is your power meter um, and getting close here to the end um, uh, as far as in, in the research um, area so all uh, devices that transmit uh, radio frequency um, has to be registered with the FCC database and that's that's public information so you can you can go to the FCC database and try to navigate through that whole myriad of information and try to find what you're looking for but uh, a lot of these most all of these devices will have some kind of a tag either on the outside or on the inside of the device that uh, states what the um, the FCC ID is for that device because it had to be registered and approved um, by the FCC. So once you know what that uh, that that device ID number is, you can go to uh, another website that someone has put up at FCC.io, which is a much more user friendly interface to get to that FCC database. If you, uh, if you if you found the uh, the FCC ID for that device, you drop that ID in that website, and it'll give you all the details that are in the the database. So, like what frequencies that device is on, uh, the details of the hardware, what chips that device is using, everything that the manufacturer had to sub, you know submit to the FCC to get that device approved. So. Um, if you're if you're wanting to get into more uh, uh, research and reverse engineering um, that's a good source of information so anyway so that's about wrap it up I'm uh, running a little bit early but um, we could um, maybe pause if anybody's got any questions I'll try to answer questions yeah Right. Yeah. So, yeah, the FCC.io, not not a government website. It's someone who has been able to scrape the database and make the the information available in a much more user friendly format. Um, anyone that's ham radio operator has had to negotiate the FCC database for your license. Realize it's not the super easiest uh, place, especially. You know, getting your amateur radio license information is not so hard, but trying to get into the the database for all these devices. So, yeah, so I don't know who it is that put that website up, but it's a good source of information. Right. So, yeah, I kind of glossed over that. Yeah. So what he found was it's it's up in the 900 megahertz range with that ISM uh, device uh, scientific. Um, device range so it's I think it was at nine I listened on mine at home I think it was around 932 megahertz somewhere like that and it does uh, frequency hopping so it's not just sitting on one frequency it, you'll you'll see peaks um, bouncing around all so it's doing frequency hopping so they, they were they were much smarter than the garage door op openers <laughs> <laughs> garage door openers were on one frequency and just an 8-bit uh, code um, so it's so they're they were much smarter about it it's uh, a cross of uh, right right yeah so like two or three megahertz of bandwidth that it's the frequency hopping so you'll see the little peaks 
Yeah, so apparently, all right, apparently this the, the gentleman that did the YouTube, he's he's written uh the plugins for the software that can that can capture that. And then once you capture it, you still don't quite see the the raw data. You have to do that uh, CRC uh he shows it on his website how to how to basically decode that CRC coding to actually then get to the data and I may or may not be saying that right but it was it was more than what I could demo in a, a, a one-hour talk so I decided I mention it point you to YouTube if you're interested but I thought that was a very interesting use case yeah yeah Uh, is, are, it's the spectrum analyzer standard for all software defined radios. A lot of what I've seen is yes. Um, um, right. And it depends, right. Depends on how that radio, that SDR radio is designed. Um, I've got, I've got a, a Zegu G90, which is an SDR and it has a, a spectrum analyzer on it and a ICOM I see 7300, which has a much nicer uh, spectrum analyzer and waterfall. So uh, that's definitely kind of a standard feature with a SDR radio is to give you some kind of spectrum an analyzer or waterfall display. But uh, like when you're using the G GQ uh, uh, RC um, software, you're you're getting a spectrum analyzer view, and that's what I'll uh, fire up on the computer at the other session. Let people look at that. Um, any other questions uh, that I can try to answer <laughs> in an intelligent manner? Okay. Um, well, uh, feel free to uh, drop me an email at my uh, that's my ham radio email address. Um, uh, I can answer any questions I possibly can, but. Uh, and uh, at 11, I'll be next door for the Birds of the Feather, and uh, we'll play around with some of these devices. And uh, thanks, everyone, for uh, coming to the presentation. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. And I guess...